Greetings and salutations, and welcome to Vesperisms, the art of thinking for yourself. I'm your host, author-illustrator Vesper Stamper, and this is a weekly 20-minute recalibration of your artistic worldview. So grab your coffee and have a seat in the big comfy red velvet chair in my studio, and let's get started. Since this is our very first episode, I thought we'd lay some foundations. Who am I? What is this podcast about? What the heck is an artistic worldview anyway? Well, let's just dive in, shall we? I am an author illustrator. I create books. I'm an illustrator of lots of things, album covers, websites, product packaging and such, but my eternal love is picture books. But I never considered myself a writer. My first novel, What the Night Sings, began as a small project in my illustration MFA program, and before I knew it, I had a brand new career as a novelist. It turns out that stories were always living in me, but I didn't know how to release them into their full reality until then. It took me 16 years to get there. And I'm grateful for that, because even though I felt primed and ready for success right out of my undergrad, had I been one of those rare early successes, I wouldn't have had the maturity or the self-understanding to be able to properly handle it. So even though I've always known that I was an artist, I've been on a much longer and more circuitous journey than I expected. And if you're watching or listening to this, you may be in a similar situation. Maybe something cut your artistic journey short and you're trying to recapture something you once loved. Or maybe you're just getting started in the arts and the amount of information out there is overwhelming to you. Or maybe you're not an artist, or you don't realize you are. But when you're around artists, you kind of like how they see the world and you want to try to capture a little bit of that for yourself. Whatever the reason you're here, I want to introduce you to the motto of our show. Write it down or memorize it. It's going to be a good thing to repeat to yourself in unexpected times. Ready? Here it is. The work isn't everything, but everything is the work. What does that mean exactly? Well, hold on to it because now that you know a little bit about me, let's lay out some foundational principles about this podcast, Vesperisms. First of all, what this podcast is not. This is not a podcast about business, except that we'll probably talk about business sometimes. It's not a podcast about 10 hot ways to be more creative right now, though we'll probably talk about that too. There are so many podcasts out there that are amazing and smart about art. For instance, there's Three Point Perspective, which is a total insider's view of the business of illustration, led by my friend Lee White and his pals Will Terry and Jake Parker. There are interview shows, like my favorite, Makers and Mystics, where my friend Stephen Roach interviews a wide variety of artists of all disciplines, talking about how art and spiritual life dovetail. There are intellectual shows about art theory, and there are inspirational shows that will help you not give up on your dream with meditations and journaling exercises. And you know what? We may touch on all of those. I'll even have the occasional interview guest myself, but this podcast is not one of those. Vesperisms is a show about reclaiming an artistic worldview. You may have noticed that artists have a different way of looking at the world, and if you're an artist, your friends may have called you artsy, or worse, the gag-inducing arty, or quirky, or different, or even odd, or maybe even a little strange or a little out there. I'm being nice here. It can get ugly. Maybe you've been shamed for being creative. Maybe you've found, like me, that you seem to fit nowhere. Well, then this is the show for you, because we artists are made this way. It's not an accident that you process the world differently or that you're a misfit who always seems to live in the lobby instead of the sanctuary, if you know what I mean. The fact is there are many, many ways to see the world. Accountants, plumbers, athletes, these come with their own set of assumptions. Not all worldviews are positive, and surely not all artists are fantastic people. But an artistic view of the world can be one of service to the world. And look, I'm not saying that the artistic worldview is superior. Not at all. I'm going to give you a little word picture here. Picture humanity as a chair. A big throne-like chair that has to hold a lot of weight. Various ways of looking at the world are like the legs of that chair. We need athletes' worldviews, and scientists' worldviews, and engineers' worldviews. But without including the artist's way of seeing, the weight of the world cannot be properly supported. You are needed, desperately needed. But it's not easy to keep your head screwed on straight. In fact, everything around you, and I mean everything, 
is conspiring to short circuit this perspective. You have enemies. One of them is distraction, and we're going to tackle that. One is other people's opinions, and we are going to go there too. But one of the biggest enemies to artists that I've been witnessing, especially over the last six or seven years, is the political worldview. It's a valid one, don't get me wrong, but it's one of the legs on that chair that wants to become the chair. It has to be kept in its proper place. The political worldview would like to divide all of humanity into groups, camps, factions, and pit them against each other. It drains color from the world. It thrives on fear. It's unforgiving, and it demands conformity, and it is incredibly fragile. Does that sound like everything an artist would say on opposite day? Divisive, colorless, afraid, conforming? But it is absolutely the prevailing view in our culture right now. I mean, you even talk to elementary school students and you hear this worldview. It's fine if old crotchety people with no senses of humor want to line up on a cable news show and sound off. But when it gets so entrenched that little kids are spouting the opinions of their teachers or their grumpy uncle from Thanksgiving, you know you're in trouble. So, divisive, colorless, afraid, conforming. Those are all elements that are not an artistic worldview. But what is an artistic worldview? Number one, artists see. There's a word that the average person doesn't really use anymore, and that's the word prophetic. Do we believe that there are legit prophets today that people can prophesy and give prophecies? Aren't those old humorless men with long beards who live in the desert and eat insects and shout insults at people? No, no, no. A prophet isn't a fortune teller either, or a psychic or a spiritualist. A prophet is someone who sees. Someone who's able to peek behind the curtain and show a side of reality, and I do mean reality, not fantasy, that not everyone perceives. Yes, that can take the form of social commentary, for instance, in the early works of Van Gogh or Daumier, but it can also take the form of the intense humanity of Rembrandt or the atmospheric essence of a Japanese Sumi-e painting or the astonishing beauty of a Jesse Norman aria. The artist is able to pull the unseen into the scene and hold it out as an offering to help people understand deeply that there is more to being human than consuming goods and pushing buttons. Number two, an artistic worldview is expansive. No, I didn't say expensive, though it can be, and don't look at my last art store receipt. An artistic worldview is always letting out its tent pegs. Artists are curious. We're insatiable. We're always learning. We're always wanting to try new things, new materials, new movements, new camera lenses. We read a lot. We have big appetites. We have soul appetites. When I was working on What the Night Sings, a little nugget of curiosity that I picked up from watching a documentary about the post-Holocaust period turned into a downright obsession that I had to actually put some boundaries on after a while. I couldn't learn enough. I couldn't process enough. I was willing to endure real psychological anguish in order to tell this story through words and pictures. What I often say is that I took in as much of the horror as I could and metabolized it within myself so that I could offer it to my audience. I had to make my soul expand bigger than it ever had. I'm not going to lie. It took courage. Sometimes it scared me. But it changed me. For the better, I think. It made me bigger on the inside. Artists teach themselves to be unafraid to not write anything off until we understand the thing, until we teach ourselves to encompass possibility. Now, I'm not saying that it makes us dumping grounds for everything we come across. That's not healthy. And actually, that can be a contributing factor to a lot of artists' struggle with both mental and physical illness. Sometimes we stay too open. We are allowed to contract when we need to, to care for ourselves, and ultimately sometimes to say no to things we don't agree with or don't believe or can't handle. But when the next inspiration comes, we have a little more room to explore because we've become bigger on the inside than we are on the outside. Number three, an artistic worldview is human-centered. I mean this in the sense of two things, the body and the audience. All of the arts, whether painting, writing, dancing, making music, 
are centered in the body. Now, I'm a person of faith, and so I'm going to bring spiritual concepts into this conversation. And one of those concepts is of the human being as an entity created in the image of an infinitely creative God. What that means is that every person, whether friend or foe, no matter their ethnicity, belief system, geographic location, economic status, every single person is a reflection of that being. Every single human is a living, breathing locus of glory, including you. It means that every person is full of dignity and worth, including you, and must not be misused. It also means that you've been made on purpose as a creative being, whether you're an artist with a capital A or not. You know, I once had a friend say that the best authors are those who are critical theorists first. Well, I could not disagree more. There are plenty of things you can and should build on theory first. Engineering would be one of those things. You don't want somebody building a skyscraper who's just, you know, trying out some new experiments with gravity. But before an artist ever creates or conceives a work, it comes through the senses and it's processed in the body and then it's expressed with the body, the hands, the feet, the face, the whole body. Theory is external and it's after the fact. Theory is helpful for understanding a painting, but not terribly useful for creating one. Artists get into real trouble when they become disembodied, when they think that art is something that exists only as this mystical force outside of themselves. They'll deny themselves sleep, food, healthy relationships. They find themselves wishing that they could literally detach from their bodies in order to make more work. And I know because I have spent the greater part of my life like that. So I'm with you. And then there's the audience. Yes, there are some who are recluses like Emily Dickinson, incurable introverts, even agoraphobic creators. And they're part of the artistic family too, but central to being an artist is the sense of audience. It's the sense of relationship. I remember taking a tour of an Eastern Orthodox church and the priest showed me some icons painted by an elderly woman who became housebound toward the end of her life. Well, when she passed away and they were cleaning out her house, they discovered that this woman had painted every square inch of her home with images. She didn't necessarily do those with an audience in mind, but even she had to be thinking that someone at some point was going to see what she had created. If she hadn't, she would have painted white or beige over everything instead of continuing to paint until her dying day. There are a lot of reasons why artists make work. You could call it self-expression, but not all of it is. Some of it is just experimentation or play. Some of it is social commentary, but we all create in an individual human body. And at some point our work and ourselves are going to intersect with the larger human body. And that necessarily implies a responsibility to both. We weren't born as cats or pigeons or trees. We are human beings in a human family. So as artists, the more we're aware of this, the better. And lastly, number four, an artistic worldview allows for growth and change. Artists, as you may have noticed, need to move around a lot. We're always traveling, going to performances or museums, or even just cafes and bookstores. We have unusual friends. We talk about ideas a lot. Artists understand deeply and sometimes woefully the fact that we're on a journey. You may look at a picture from your childhood and say, wow, that kid looked so normal. How'd he turn out to be an artist? We're not the same people we even were five years ago. We're always renewing, reinventing, recalibrating. But the prevailing view in our culture right now is one of a static, rigid way of being. We must all come out of the womb with the correct way of thinking, speaking, and acting, or we will be canceled. And we have long written Twitter feeds to catch us out. And unfortunately, many artists have drunk this Kool-Aid and have stopped thinking like artists. Starting from a place of theory or agenda, they think that if their work does not express a political worldview, it isn't valid or socially responsible. But remember, the political leg of the chair wants to become the whole chair. The artistic worldview distributes the weight. It allows for the journey. It allows people to shift and grow and change. 
we don't view Picasso's early work the way we view his later work. And unless they've fully bought into the Instagram paradigm, any artist will tell you that for every good work they create, there are 20 that went into the trash. <laughs> and we can allow the same grace for people. When we think like artists, we allow for growth and change in ourselves and others. So remember our motto from the beginning of the episode, work isn't everything, but everything is the work. Artists, let's face it, we can get obsessed. The aim of Vesperisms is to help you put the actual creation of your work in its proper place as one facet of who you are, and to understand that everything the artist sees and does, whether it's choreographing a dance or making dinner for your kids, is something that you will internalize, process, and allow to emerge into what you create. It's worth paying attention to what you see, what you let in, what you embody, and how you let things grow and change. That's why work isn't everything, but everything is the work. Now each episode, I'm going to give you a recommended read to further your recalibration into the artistic worldview over the week. And this week's recommended read is Art and Fear, Observations on the Perils and Rewards of Art Making by David Bales and Ted Orland. This short volume is one of the most read books on the artistic process, and you will find yourself breathing a sigh of relief that you're not alone in some of the anguish that goes along with art making. I especially appreciated reading that the figure of the extraordinary genius artist is mostly a myth. This is a good time to dive into books like this. It's profound without being dense. If you're like me, you'll read each chapter twice. It's that refreshing. So thanks for joining me for this week's Vesperisms. You can subscribe right now, and if you go to anchor.fm slash Vesperisms, you can leave me a voice message to let me know what you'd like me to talk about or who you'd like me to talk to on this podcast. There's a link to that in the show notes. You can also follow me on Instagram at Vesper Illustration, and if you subscribe to my newsletter at VesperIllustration.com, you'll not only get news about my work, but you'll also get a free outtake chapter from my newest book, A Cloud of Outrageous Blue, which happens to be about a girl discovering her creative gifts at the onset of the Great Plague of 1348, so kind of timely. And I'd love if you would leave a five-star review on iTunes. That'll help others find this podcast and spread the message of an artistic worldview to more people. Music for Vesperisms is provided by Ben and Vesper. Remember, your voice is important. Your contribution matters. And work isn't everything, but everything is the work. See you next time. <laughs>